A reading from St. Paul's first epistle to the church in Corinth, the 11th chapter, beginning at the 23rd verse. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And with your the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left, they left and found things just as Jesus told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from this vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go and But woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be and who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority, call, the authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater than the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred, conferred on, one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel." The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord I speak to you in the name of God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The good news I want to proclaim tonight is that with the gift of Holy Communion, Jesus provided, with a, provided for us the support he knew we would need. In our tradition of Anglicanism, we celebrate Holy Communion every week. But why? Why do we celebrate Holy Communion at all? 
Well, as we just heard from both, both Luke's gospel and from 1 Corinthians, Jesus said, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's why. Jesus said to do it, so we do it. Well, perhaps that should be reason enough, but I guess it's not enough for me. You know, as a kid, when my parents asked me to do something and I asked why, a response of because I said so was never satisfactory to me. So I'm grateful that the church in its wisdom has us take an opportunity like tonight to stop and consider why we do this, why we do Holy Communion. And I suppose that means that it's my job now to say something more than because Jesus said so. So we'll give it a try. The good news is that with the gift of Holy Communion, Jesus provided us with the support he knew we would need. Tonight's passage from Luke's gospel that you heard recounts how on this day, a little more than 2,000 years ago, Jesus sent Peter and John to fulfill arrangements that he had already made, Jesus had already made, for the disciples to eat the Passover that night. And this Passover meal was part of a religious feast that God's people, the Jews, had been keeping annually since God had instituted it some 1,500 years before, or more or less they had kept it annually. Our passage from Exodus described when God first instituted the Feast of Passover. But suffice to say then, it's likely that each one of Jesus' disciples would have eaten the Passover meal on this night every year for their entire lives. They had eaten it, right? It was a ritual celebration of the sort of master story of the Jewish people that was the foundation of their identity. It was a meal that reaffirmed their covenant with God and reminded them each and every year both who God is and who they were as his children. That he is a God who saves, who had worked wonders in rescuing them from slavery in Egypt, and that they were his beloved. So returning to Luke, when the hour came... Luke says that Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So Jesus knew that his arrest was imminent, which would then be followed by his trial and his execution. Things were about to change forever, not just for Jesus though, but for his disciples And so Jesus was eager to eat this Passover with them because he intended that night to transform the Jewish Passover, the covenant meal between God and his people. He intended to transform the Passover meal into a meal of a new covenant that God was establishing, that God would establish through the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. And what would make this new meal, which we now call Holy Communion, what would make it such a gift is that through it, Jesus provided support for his followers, support that he knew we would need. I said that Jesus knew things were about to change for the disciples, and this is true in all sorts of ways, of course. But the most significant change would be in how his disciples would be in relationship with him after this night. For three years, the disciples had lived with Jesus, had followed him wherever he went, had eaten all their meals together, had shared the same sleeping quarters. But after his death and resurrection, that would be changed. Jesus, the risen Jesus, would only appear to them, seems like a handful of times, And then after 40 days, Jesus would ascend into heaven only to send his spirit to them. So this means that in a manner manner of 53 days, the disciples would go from spending every waking moment with Jesus 
to not being able to touch him or see him and trying to learn how to be in a spiritual relationship with him through prayer. Now, when we ponder that, our response to those disciples may be like, welcome to the party. You know, this has been our plight as long as we've known it, right? Our whole lives. A spiritual relationship is the only sort of relationship we've ever had with Jesus. But I think we can at least empathize that it wouldn't have been easy, this change for them. After, Jesus, after his resurrection, once Jesus offers for Thomas to put his fingers and his hands and his side, Jesus will say, because you've seen me, you've believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Because the Lord knows it's not always easy to believe in him, to trust him, even though we can't even see him. Jesus knew all of this. He knew this was what was in the cards, what was going to happen. And so this is why, part of the reason, he instituted the gift of Holy Communion. Providing our faith, setting a foundation, establishing a practice to provide our faith with with some much-needed support. Because we cannot touch his hands or side, Because getting a hug from Jesus or even a high five, I think Jesus would high five, don't you? Because that's not on the menu for us and our lives in this era that we live in, this era of the spirit, he instituted the sacrament of his body and blood to give us a tangible way to relate to him and to welcome him. Perhaps for those particular times, in particular for times when we aren't sure what to think, when it's hard to mentally welcome him, we can still physically welcome him. When our faith is weak or confused, we can still come to the rail and receive him physically. The good news is that with the gift of Holy Communion, Jesus provided support for us that he knew we would need. But as simple as receiving Holy Communion can be, just receiving Jesus by eating and drinking. An infant can do it without understanding a thing about it, right? As simple as it is, Holy Communion is at the same time packed, packed with meaning. Meaning that speaks to our identity. Just as the Passover meal spoke, to the identity of God's people, the Jews. That meal was meant to reaffirm and form their identity, and so this meal of the new covenant is meant to do for us, reminding us both who God is, particularly who he showed himself to be in the death and resurrection of Christ, and reminding us who we are as his children who are in desperate need of his help and salvation. So just to unpack a little bit of the meaning within this simple practice, maybe beginning with the fact that it's just a ritual of eating in the first place. This reminds us of the choice by Adam and Eve that they made to disobey God by eating, to eat the fruit in the Garden of Eden, bringing sin into the world and upon the whole human race. And so the act of eating in Holy Communion is meant to signify a reversal of that, the reversal of sin and its effects on us and our lives. It's meant to represent that the antidote to sin has come to us in Jesus Christ. But in addition to that, the fact that we as humans even need to eat at all, the fact that we need to eat for our biological survival with bread being the most basic of staples. This reminds us of the scripture Jesus quoted to Satan, that man does not live on bread alone, that there is more to life than just our biological survival, that we are spiritual beings, 
And Jesus invites us to be born a second time into an eternal living relationship with him. And this also reminds us that we need renewal in that, though, in that life. Just as it's necessary to eat food every day, spiritually, we need regular practices, Holy Communion itself perhaps being the chief of them, to remain in relationship with God and abide in Him. But again, life is not just something to survive biologically or spiritually. It's not just about surviving life in this world. Life in this world can be filled with many blessings, much joy, as we all know. All the more when we recognize that the source of all good things is the Lord. And so the element of wine, hearkening even to Jesus' first miracle, the use of wine in celebration and the good feelings it can produce in us, when enjoyed in moderation. These are a reminder that life is not just to be survived, but that it is a gift and to be enjoyed. And that Jesus is right there with us in those moments of blessing and enjoyment. Also in the spirit of a party, Holy Communion reminds us that we are social animals. Even though each of us individually receives the sacrament, we do so as a group, as a body. We do it with one another. The common cup is meant to communicate this as well, that we belong to one another, that we are our brother's keeper, sister's keeper. That despite the hyper-individualism of our age, we need one another particularly need others who are on this journey with Christ like we are. So these are just some of the ways that Holy Communion teaches us what life on this earth is supposed to be about, some of the meaning this simple sacrament is packed with. It's packed with so much meaning that I couldn't even attempt to cover it all, but there are just two final elements I want to mention. It's been said that in Holy Communion, the Lord gives us the gift of himself. As our scriptures tonight recounted, Jesus said, this is my body given for you. And this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Of both of these, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And in biblical thought, remembering did not merely mean to call to mind, Rather, it's something where we're asking God, that we're asking God to do in the present. And God spiritually and mysteriously, miraculously gives himself to us in this sacrament. And he does this with the intention that we might become what we eat. You've heard it said, you are what you eat. This is why Jesus gave us a sacrament of eating, giving us himself, his body and blood, in love for the world, that we might follow him in that same manner of living. We might become like him, become like what we eat, living in loving sacrifice for the sake of others rather than just living for ourselves. As Jesus told his disciples around the table in Luke tonight, he said, you're not to be like the people of the world who live for themselves. The greatest among you is one who serves. So when we receive Jesus and Holy Communion, we can do it as a physical act of prayer, asking him to make us more like him. And then finally, Holy Communion is a reminder of the surety of our hope for the future because we are his. Our Luke passage closed with Jesus assuring the 12 that the next time they drank of the fruit of the vine with him, it would be at a table in his kingdom fully come. Holy communion is that. It is a pledge of our redemption that Jesus has grabbed us from the pit and saved us and that we belong to him forever. And since he would overcome sin and death, 
in his resurrection. Nothing can separate us, not height or depth. Nothing can separate us from him and his love. The good news is that in the gift of Holy Communion, Jesus provided support for us that he knew we would need. And because our human frailty still makes us prone to lose our sense of identity, because we're constantly receiving messages from other places about what our identity is, false messages, we regularly need this reminder of who we are, whose we are and of the way of eternal living that's been opened to us all because of Jesus. And our Lord invites us to do this, to partake in this gift with regularity, because it is a simple way to continue grounding ourselves in him and opening our lives to him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.